Welcome back everyone to the ATC Tips and Procedures course, continuing today with separation standards. And the FAA Order JO7110.65, or the .65 for short is what controllers refer to it as, is the rule book for ATC, so all of the separation standards are spelled out and listed in the .65. And there are two categories in air traffic control, there's en route, uh, which is the center and terminal which is approach so en route controllers work in the air route traffic control centers and the terminal controllers work in tracons which are the terminal radar approach controls and also uh, sometimes in towers so most terminal facilities are combined or what they call up down facilities which means you have a tower and at the base of that tower you have a separate uh, facility or a building down there which is the tracon and it's a small radar room where the approach controllers work and uh, at larger facilities in some parts of the country in really busy congested airspace like Southern California or uh, New York City, they'll have uh, combined tracons, uh, NorCal, SoCal Approach, for instance. And those tracons are not necessarily located on airports at the bases of towers. They are occasionally off airport. But uh, in most parts of the country where you have a tracon, you have an up-down facility with a tower and a tracon combined there on the airport grounds. And controllers are assigned one or the other when they're hired, and they're trained differently. So different uh, different academies, they're all in Oklahoma City at the Mike Minerni Aeronautical Center, uh, but they are different courses of study, different curriculums for en route and terminal. So I was an en route controller or a center controller, and center controllers are not trained on terminal separation standards, and terminal uh, controllers are not trained on en route separation standards. So uh, you might kind of you know know a couple of things just from... Uh, being in the biz, but for the most part, center controllers know those standards and the approach controllers know those uh, those separate standards. And uh, so let's get into some of the center standards, which are the ones that I know about. <clears throat> and center controllers generally use five miles laterally and 1,000 feet vertically for separation in most airspace. There are some exceptions, which I'll get into with you. And terminal controllers use lower separation minima because their radar updates faster and the aircraft of course must be run closer together in those tight terminal areas where you have less airspace there's more congestion more aircraft are run closer together and of course they're all going to the same uh, airport in the case of a busy class bravo airport for instance and they have to be sequenced into one or two or maybe three runways and uh, so terminal controllers are running aircraft much closer together luckily everyone is going more slowly in the terminal environment and the en route environment uh, generally speaking aircraft are moving much faster uh, so the separation separation standards are higher. So terminal controllers um, can use you know three miles lateral separation, maybe 500 feet vertically. And again, they've got different separation minima that I won't get into because I'm not an expert on that. But center controllers in most airspace are using five miles and a thousand feet. This over here is a picture of uh, an airport traffic control tower. I'm trying to remember what airport this is. This might be San Jose, and um, <clears throat> this gives you an idea of you know. Uh, a tower here would be, uh, you would spend, you know, maybe a shift in the tower and then you'd go down and work the tracon. Um, I think if this is San Jose, they might have a consolidated NorCal tracon, so, you know, you wouldn't actually have a tracon at the base of the tower, but at most airports, you do have a tracon down here, and uh, you would spend a shift in the tracon and then a shift in the tower, and you would kind of go where, you, you know, where you needed, where they needed you, rather. So uh, for radar separation, which is how most separation is applied these days, um, using a combination of radar and also ADS-B surveillance, which is satellite-based surveillance. And uh, there are still some non-radar coverage areas, uh, quite a few actually in the country. So uh, non-radar separation is, is used, but most of the time controllers are using radar to separate you in the in route environment. Uh, in the terminal environment, they're uh, almost entirely using radar. Um, and uh, maybe some ADSB uh, as well to, to separate aircraft. So uh, flight level 410 and below for the in route separation standards, again, is five miles laterally, 1,000 feet vertically for RVSM aircraft. Now, non-RVSM aircraft require 2,000 feet vertical separation between flight level 290 and flight level 410. Formation flights require additional ladder, lateral separation. So again, there are some exceptions to the five miles and 1,000 feet. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have a formation flight, you've got to add an extra mile um, because the uh, uh, aircraft can be spread out within that formation uh, up to a mile. And then also another exception, for instance, would be fuel dumping. You've got to allow 2,000 feet vertically uh, below an aircraft that's dumping fuel so that somebody doesn't get hosed down beneath, uh, beneath an aircraft that's dumping fuel. The fuel does evaporate quickly as it, as it uh, falls. 
and then above flight level 410 to flight level 600 all aircraft again it's still five miles laterally but 2,000 feet vertically whether you're RVSM or not so the RVSM stratum is 290 to 410 above that everyone gets 2,000 feet of vertical separation regardless of the equipment that you have on board and way up high above flight level 600 for all aircraft it goes up to 10 miles laterally and 5,000 feet vertically so it's very rare to have traffic up that high and um, it's even more rare to have two together up that high so a lot of controllers have forgotten this they might not even know that it's different uh, which doesn't usually cause a problem because you don't have a lot of traffic up there so um, the reason this increases with altitude is um, because we don't have as much confidence in the altimetry at those higher altitudes the altimetry errors increase as you climb and of course you know flight level 600 uh, aircraft are moving very fast so generally speaking, five miles and a thousand feet. Uh, once you get into the RVSM stratum, if you're not RVSM, it goes up to 2,000 feet. And here's an exception at low altitude using a single site radar, three miles lateral separation is approved. And this is for center controllers and so not, you know, so terminal controllers do this all day, every day. But uh, for in route controllers, normally we're limited to five miles unless we have a specific SOP for a sector that we're working. If there's a single site radar, um, I think it has to be an ASR, which is an area surveillance radar, which is the type of radar that uh, terminal radar approach controls use. This is a picture of one here. Um, this antenna swings pretty fast. It updates once every six seconds. In route radar is mosaic. It only updates once every 12 seconds. So you're getting updates a lot more quickly with a single site ASR, low altitude, close in. You can run the aircraft a little bit closer together, <clears throat> three miles. Uh, normally in the in route environment, there's really um, you don't really have much occasion to run aircraft that closely, but you could if you had that SOP. And then there's visual separation. So this is a hot button uh, topic right now after the very tragic midair over the uh, Potomac River uh, recently. Uh, but uh, it is in the rule book here below 18,000 feet MSL. The controller may approve visual separation between two, air two aircraft. Could even be more than two if at least one aircraft has the other in sight. So. Um, the phraseology for that would be November 1, 2, 3, maintain visual separation from the, for instance, Boeing 737 or whatever the type aircraft is. And then the pilot assumes responsibility for collision avoidance at that point. So out of class alpha airspace below 18, if at least one or both aircraft have each other in sight, the controller has the option of using visual, uh, visual separation. Now, if the pilot accepts that, uh, the controller at that point uh, does not have responsibility to maintain that five miles and a thousand feet of separation. The aircraft can get closer than that um, and it's up to the pilots to not collide. So which brings me to my next point, controller preference. Some controllers are not comfortable with visual separation and they also might even add a little bit more separation than the minimum. Um, you'll hear this <laughs> expression sometimes in air traffic control, I add a mile for the family, you know, so that you don't have a deal or a separation error, uh, which, you know, if you get enough of those can be career ending or if they're really egregious so that can be a big problem for your career so um, some controllers are not uh, comfortable with minimum separation and uh, might add a little bit more now they're not technically supposed to do that you know in the rule book in fact when you're in the faa academy that's a big no-no and you can lose points and get fired for such things if you uh, if you don't score highly enough on your evals and, and you're not using minimum separation but in the real world of air traffic control a lot of controllers um, aren't running aircraft exactly five miles apart. They're maybe adding a little bit more. And then uh, some controllers don't use visual separation even though they can. Uh, they're not comfortable with it. And frankly, um, I think that's a reasonable point to make, in, at least in some conditions, if the aircraft are going to be very close. It's not the safest thing to do. Uh, you know, pilots understand that it's awfully difficult to find other aircraft out the window sometimes and also to keep them in sight. And uh, I think any of us who have flown for a while can tell you that, you know, we've, we've looked out, we've seen other traffic, and then we've, you know, gone back inside to do a, another task, looked out, and we, we lost them, you know. So it's not necessarily the safest form of separation, but it is, uh, it is in the rule book, and, and it is still sometimes used. And then there's non-radar separation. So non-radar separation rules are very complex, and they're seldom used because... Uh, many controllers have forgotten how to use them. So this is something that controllers are trained on in the academy. There's actually a non-radar portion of the academy where all you do is non-radar separation before you ever get to the radar um, section. And uh, you, you learn all these rules. But they're very complicated, and these days the radar coverage, uh, especially now with ADSB, and ADSB um, came on the scene after I left the FAA, so I'm not an expert on the ADSB stuff. But 
uh, the, the surveillance is so good these days that yeah, you, you really don't need to use the non-radar separation rules a whole lot anymore, although there is you know occasion where you might need to. Uh, but there are actually three different forms. There's longitudinal separation, which means you have aircraft that are on the same route, such as a Victor Airway or a VOR radial, and you're separating those aircraft using time and or distance, so DME. You have lateral separation, which is aircraft on different routes, and they're separated using DME, degrees, divergence, and crossing restrictions. So for instance, if you have one aircraft that's on um, this Victor Airway and they're inbound to this VOR, and you have another aircraft that's on this airway and they're inbound to this VOR, you would issue a crossing restriction depending on how many degrees of divergence you have between these two airways to make sure that you had vertical separation when you lost lateral separation as those aircraft close in on that VOR together. And then vertical separation, of course, which is similar to radar separation, but the only difference there is that pilot reported altitudes are used instead of mode C because you can't see them on radar. So these aren't things that really ever get used realistically very much anymore, um, except for in very rare circumstances. And again, some controllers have forgotten the rules and they're not even comfortable with those, uh, with those rules. And then non-radar airports. So um, kind of the same idea here. There are complex separation rules that exist in the point sixty five but most controllers are not familiar with how, how to use them at these non-radar airports, so especially at uncontrolled airports where you just have a small GA airport kind of out in the middle of nowhere, uncontrolled, there's no tower there. Uh, there are rules if you have two aircraft that want to depart at the same time or if you have two arrivals that are going to be there close to the same time, there are some rules to run those aircraft fairly expeditiously into the airport, but the rules are complicated and, and a lot of controllers have forgotten them <clears throat> and I can't blame them. So. Uh, most controllers just use the one in one out policy at these uncontrolled airports, which means if you have an aircraft cleared in on an approach, nobody else is using that airport for arrival or departure until that aircraft calls and cancels IFR if they're on the ground. Um, or if you have a departure, you're going to get them into radar contact, going to get them out of the way and then release the next departure. And then at controlled airports that are non-radar, because not all towers have radar, or even if they do have radar, it might not be approved for radar separation. Uh, tower visual separation can be used to expedite the traffic flow. So the controllers and the tower have their binoculars. They can look out the window and if they can see two aircraft, they can apply tower visual separation if they're approved to do so by the center controller. And that's coordinated over the landline. And that can be a way of running aircraft a little bit more expeditiously to uh, a non-radar airport. And then uh, in the event of special use airspace and sectors separation from those things, active special use airspace or what ATC calls SAA or special activities areas that contain aircraft activities require three nautical miles of lateral separation from the boundary of those airspace areas. So for instance, if you have an active MOA and the military is doing dogfighting training in that MOA so that it, that MOA contains active aircraft activities, the controller has to keep you three nautical miles away from the edge or the boundary of that MOA. You can't straddle the line and fly right up alongside of it because the controllers are protecting for what they call a spill out, which happens rather frequently, <laughs> which means the, uh, the military aircraft actually accidentally spill out of that edge and, and then correct back inside of the MOA. So they don't want you right up along that boundary in case there's a spill out. Uh, now, if the, uh, if the special use airspace does not contain aircraft activities, um, then in that case, the controller can run you right up along that boundary. So, and unless otherwise coordinated, uh, such as a point out, or an SOP or an LOA, which is a standard operating procedure letter of agreement between facilities or between sectors. Controllers must maintain a two and a half nautical mile buffer from sector boundaries to ensure five nautical mile separation from aircraft and other sectors. So if each if uh, each controller on either side of the sector boundary are making sure that you're not flying within a two and a half mile buffer to that boundary, then you have five miles separation between potentially two aircraft, you know, one and one on either side of that boundary, if that uh, very rare situation should present itself. So you can coordinate otherwise a point out to, uh, to run that aircraft right up along the boundary or even into the other, uh, the other sector if need be. And then also a word about TCAS RAs. Um, so TCAS, if you're not familiar, is the Traffic Alert and Collision Avoidance System or the fish finder in the aircraft and an RA is a resolution advisory. So this is the TCAS telling you how to avoid a collision with another aircraft. TCAS RAs always have priority over ATC instructions. Always, always, always follow the RA. So if you are um, flying along and you get a traffic advisory or traffic alert from your TA, 
or excuse me, from your TCAS, and then it turns into a resolution advisory. ATC is telling you to do one thing, and the TCAS is telling you to do another. So for instance, in this case, you have a climb command. So the, the, the TCAS would say climb, climb, to avoid this aircraft right here. And uh, ATC gave you a descent, disregard the descent, and climb. Put the VSI needle in that green arc. So advise ATC that you're responding to an RA, and then also when the, uh, when the maneuver is completed, let them know that the RA maneuver is completed and, and you can you know, take their instructions from there. And remember the other aircraft's RA is opposite yours. The two TCASs are coordinating with each other to send you up and the other one down. And ATC does not necessarily know that. So uh, they could issue instructions that are actually making the problem worse, which is why we want to follow the RA. And if you're not comfortable with separation, say something. So if you're flying along and you can see an aircraft on the TCAS or maybe even out the window and it looks like the separation is going to be pretty tight, especially if ATC um, hasn't pointed that aircraft out to you or given you, you know, a heads up as to what their plan is for that aircraft, go ahead and ask them. You know, don't, don't let the situation, uh, you know, develop into something that's unsafe. Go ahead and speak up. And that is it for this uh, series. So thanks everybody for watching and, uh, of course, my members have been along for the ride for uh, this series of videos. Uh, if you're not a member, feel free, if you're interested in this kind of thing, to join the channel. Uh, it's just a small monthly fee, and you'll have access to the, uh, the whole playlist of ATC tips and procedures videos that are in the members area, and also the, AT, or the uh, PC-12, rather, Systems Boot Camp, uh, Flight Planning and Weather Avoidance course, uh, PC-12 Emergency Procedures course, and, of course, more to come. So thanks, everybody, for watching, and I will see you on the next one.